And this is like a first grade class to you, except for a bit harder. The reason why it's more difficult is because when you were in first grade or preschool, those kinds of things. I say first grade because we didn't have preschool and kindergarten when I went to school. We learned how to read in first grade. Um, when you were learning how to read, you probably already knew somewhat of the language. You were already speaking. So you knew the words once you were able to recognize the letters and start recognizing the words. It, it, you were able to read. The difference here is you're not only learning a new alphabet, a new alphabet, you're also learning a new language. So you have a double burden on you. So we go slow. Um, we try to do a letter a week. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, sometimes it takes us a week, a class and a half to get through a letter because there's a lot of information because I'm not just going to, to show you the letter, but I'm going to tell you about the letter because Hebrew is different from English in a great, tremendous way. Um, and so we're, we're going to discuss a lot of that tonight. One of the things that um, you need to be able to distinguish, there's two words that sound familiar. I know most of you here are fairly educated. I don't know you, but um, this is just information for you. So we have two words that you need to be able to distinguish because both come into play in Hebrew. And that is translation and transliteration. Because we will ta be talking about both both of these words come into play between English and Hebrew. So translation is when you take an idea from one language and you put it into another. Okay? For example, I can say to you, como se ama? In Spanish, well, I have to translate that because there's some people here who do not speak Spanish and so I will say, what is your name? That is translation. So it's a trans to cross over, to change, okay? So translation is to take it from one language, to take the definition, if you would, from one language to another language. Transliteration sounds similar, but transliteration is the taking of the original language and writing it in another script. So, I could say, I can give you this word, which we're going to talk about in a minute anyway. I'll put it over here. This is a Hebrew word. Ahava. Everyone say Ahava. Ahava. Okay. This is a Hebrew word. Now, I'm going to translate the word for you. Ahava is translated love. Love, ahava, love. So this is the translation, but this is the transliteration, in that rather than writing the word in Hebrew, because you wouldn't understand it, I have taken the English letters and written the Hebrew in English letters. That is transliteration. So I have with me my Siddur. Can you say Siddur? Siddur is the Jewish prayer book, okay? And it is written in Hebrew with a transliteration and a translation. So this is the Hebrew, this is the transliteration, and this is the translation, okay? And almost all Siddurim, Almost all prayer books work that way. The trans the, the, this is the Hebrew, the transliteration, and then the, the translation. Okay? And almost all Hebrew prayer books and such as that work that way. Okay? See it? Yes. This is the Hebrew. This is the transliteration and then the translation. Okay? 
So you need to be able to distinguish that when I'm talking about a translation, I'm talking about the defining term in English from Hebrew to English. When I'm talking about transliteration, I'm talking about taking the Hebrew word but putting it in English letters so that you can read it. Okay? So for all of this class, when I write the Hebrew, I'm going to mostly be writing in transliteration. I will write it in English for you. Okay? The word will be a Hebrew word, but I'll, I will write it in English. That does not mean that we will never write words in Hebrew. We will. But the transliteration will be the, the uh, more frequently, the most frequently used. What are you going to learn? You're going to learn three things for the most part. The three things that I want to teach you. That is to learn to recognize the letters of the Aleph Bet. In Hebrew, it is not alphabet because that is Greek. Okay, that's a Greek term. It is called Aleph Bet. And it's usually written this way. Why? Because this, the first two letters of the alphabet, Aleph Bet, are Aleph Bet. Aleph Bet. Okay, so it's called the Aleph Bet. So we're going to, you're, I, I want you to learn to recognize the letters. So we will go over them. Um, and every week, we will quote, we will go over the letters up here as far as we know. Okay? So that means that each week you should progress one letter um, in, in the list up there. And that's the way the class will start. While you are learning the Aleph Bet, you will also learn aspects of Judaism because it comes into play with the letters. There's great significance in, in the Aleph Bet and what it means. There's great significance in, um, in the whole thing, the whole system, the whole list. This is one of the ways that Hebrew is different from English. In English, if I tell you to define the letter A, for me. What would you tell me? Define the letter A. First letter of the alphabet. Letter of the alphabet. What else? It has two sounds. A and A. Uh. Two sounds. A and A. Uh. What else? Vowel. It's a vowel. What else? It has three strokes. Capital. Okay. What else? Whoa. Give me its defining term. What does A mean? What does B mean? What does C mean? What does D mean? In English, in Spanish, in European languages, the letters by themselves have no meaning. They have no significance. They are letters to form words. In Hebrew, the very letter has significance. It has its own defining terms. And so we'll get into that. And this will also explain to you why the letters are placed where they are placed. It does not follow exactly the European alphabet. It is similar, but not exact. Also, there are some letters that are missing from the, in the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew alphabet is shorter than the English alphabet. There are only 22 letters in the Hebrew, okay? So there are some letters that, that are missing. So how do you make the sounds of those letters? You have to put two Hebrew letters together in order to come up with a single English letter that's been missing. Okay? So we'll be going over that, but so you'll learn the Aleph Bet. You will also learn um, aspects of Judaism. And you will learn some Jewish philosophy. How do Jewish people think? Because in learning this, in order to understand the Aleph Bet and understand how words are put together, you also will learn how these, how these people think. And basically what it is, is it is a distinction between Western thought process and Middle Eastern thought process. There is a difference. We don't all think alike. You'll notice that the, that the Aleph Bet starts on which side? 
the right side and it ends on the left where English starts where? The left side and <laughs> ends over here on the right. Okay? Even my Sidor, my Sidor opens up backwards. Okay? It starts here, the back, what we would consider to be the back. If you open it up here, you're going to be at the back. Why? Because everything is from right to left. And in, in essence, that is, that is the, a distinction between Middle Eastern thought process and, and Western thought process, American thought process. That a, a Western thought process could be said, you can say that it is from left to right. Middle Eastern thought process is from right to left. Okay? I'm not saying that you go from the right side of your brain to your left. I'm just telling you that there are, there are great differences in the, way they, the, in the way the two areas think. Okay? So, you'll come to see some of that. I also need to let you know, um, this is where our congregation meets. Uh, that, by the way, up there, that it, I'll, show, I'll get that out uh, and show it to you. That is our Torah scroll up there. One of the reasons why... Uh, we started these classes is because the people of the assembly wanted to learn to read the Torah scroll. Uh, the Torah scroll is written in Hebrew, and so uh, they wanted to learn to read it, so we started classes so that they could learn to read it. I took Hebrew for about 10 years at the synagogue here in Harlingen back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I studied with the rabbis uh, there for about 10 years, uh, both Hebrew and uh, Jewish uh, theology, um, philosophy, these kinds of things. Um, so um, I do have some background. I, I tell the class I'm like a, it's like a fifth grader trying to teach a first grader how to read, all right? So um, uh, it gets interesting sometimes. Um, in, in studying all of these things, I'm, it's going to confirm some of the things that you know and understand about your Bible. It will confirm some things that you know and understand about your Bible. But it's also going to question some of the things that you understand or you think you understand. Because you're coming at this, you're going to be coming at this whole thing from a whole different perspective. Basically what we're about is restoring the Hebraism, the Jewishness of the Messiah. He lived his life as an Orthodox Jew. His followers were all what we call Trushim, Pharisees. And they lived the lifestyle. They were kosher. They lived what we call Halakha. Um, they lived this life. They were Torah observant. And so our perspective is this, I'm, and I'm not trying to convert you, I'm just telling you where we come from. If you want to join with us, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine. Makes, I, I make no issue of that. Um, but just from where we come from. Our position is that Yeshua lived his life, that's his Hebrew name, Jesus. His Hebrew name is Yeshua. Everybody say Yeshua. Yeshua, Yeshua literally means salvation. So when the angel appeared, and said, you shall call him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But he didn't use the term Jesus. He said, you shall call him Yeshua, for he shall save. You shall call him, if it's translated literally, you shall call him salvation, for he shall save. Does that make sense to you? These are some of the things that we're going to find out that we're going to learn in this process. But because he was a living, breathing Jew, he was in fact Torah come to life. He was the living Torah. We want to get our, the, the, the members of this assembly, we want to live as closely to him as we possibly can. And so that's why we do what we do. So, any questions so far? By the way, this is a classroom. You're not in church. This is a classroom. Okay, questions are allowed. <coughs> Anything having to do with Judaism, even if it's not specifically on what we're discussing, we allow you to ask questions. That's why we're here, to explain. Okay? So we do what we call chasing the rabbit down the rabbit hole very frequently in this place. Okay? 
So what is chasing the rabbit down the rabbit hole? Well, something comes into your head that really doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about, but it comes in, you've been wondering about something, and so you raise your hand and you ask a question. That's called going down the rabbit hole, okay? Because I will answer any question I possibly can that comes to me. Because I want you to understand, and my philosophy is this, if you have the question, that means, <clears throat> that means that someone else also will probably have the question. If you have a question, that means somebody else is also going to have that same question. So I'm not just answering you, I'm answering a lot of people. I'm answering several people, okay? So that's our philosophy here. So this is an open class. If you have a question concerning Judaism, Judaism versus Christianity, any of these kinds of things, I've lived on both sides of, of the fence, so I have some understanding of it. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask the question, and we will answer as best as we possibly can. I promise you this, and those of you who have been in these classes can verify, that if I do not have an answer for you tonight, I will find the answer for you. And probably within the week, I will get back with you with, with the answer. Okay, because this is what I do. Okay, so uh, questions are, are acceptable. You're free to ask any questions you want. All right, so we were talking about thought. We were talking about the thought process. So we were discussing the, the idea of the difference between Middle East thought and Western thought that we do not think the same. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why the Western nations, excuse me, the Western nations have such a problem understanding the nations in the Middle East and why there's always this conflict. And the Middle East has problems understanding the Western nations and there's always this conflict because we don't think the same way. We think in different terms, in different ways. Um, one of the biggest differences is called concrete versus abstract. Concrete versus abstract. Hebrew is concrete. English is abstract. So, I wrote over here the word for love. Makes me want to sing a song. It's a thing called love. So, I wrote over here, this is the Hebrew word for love. Translated love. And I'm telling you that Hebrew is concrete and English is abstract. What do you mean? What do I mean? All right. When you say, I love, I will say, I love my wife. I love my children. I love my dog. I love Coca-Cola. I love Cheetos. I love ice cream. I love my house, I love my farm, I love my car. <clears throat> do you see how that is abstract? What do we mean by abstract? It's the opposite of concrete. It is whatever you make of it. So when I say that I love my wife and I love my dog, if you're from another place listening to this English, you're going to say, what? It doesn't make sense to you. You have the same emotional response, you have the same attitude towards your dog as you do your wife. In Hebrew, it doesn't work that way. There are other terms that are used. Because in Hebrew, this word ahava, love, it has a very specific meaning. By the way, I would encourage you to bring your Bibles because we will go there from time to time. If you have a Bible, open it to John, chapter 3, verse 16. In John 3, 16, most famous verse in the world, John 3, 16, 
You actually have given to you there the definition of love. The Hebrew there says, Ki ahava ahav Elohim et ha'olam. The English translation says what? For God so loved the world. So you have ki ahava. There's the word. Ahav ahava. Just a little preview for you. In Hebrew, when a word is doubled, ahav ahava, that empowers the word. It empowers the emotion of the word. Okay? No, it builds it up. So the greatest love basically is what when you say ahav, ahav, ahava, you're doubling the word, you're saying it's the greatest, it's the most that is possible. Okay? This is why in English it says, for God what? So loved the world. That's it. The soul being what? Meaning what? Immeasurable. Okay? He so loved the world. So what does your, the next phrase say? For God so loved the world, what? That he gave. And that is your defining term. This is the concreteness of Hebrew. That when I say ahava, when I say I love my wife, what I am saying in Hebrew is that I have given myself over to her. That is literally what it means. So when it says that God loves, it's telling you that God has given himself to this. When I say I love my wife, literally, I'm saying I'm willing to lay down my life for her. I'm willing to give my life for her. That's literally what it's saying. This is the concreteness of Hebrew. So when I take this back and forth, Hebrew to English, I say I love my dog, I love my cat, I love Coke, I love uh, uh, Cheetos, I love ice cream. Am I willing to give myself to attain those things? Am I willing to die for my dog, for Coke, for Cheetos, for ice cream, for these things? You see, in Hebrew, it has a very specific meaning. It's very concrete, very firm. Is everybody with me? Okay, let's do another one. Emuna. Everyone say Emuna. Emuna is the word that is translated faith. By the way, um, cross-reference, go back to Ahava a minute, cross-reference. In Ephesians, go in your, in your Bibles to Ephesians. You will often hear me calling the New Testament side, it's called Brit Hadasha. In chapter 5, so in Ephesians chapter 5, we call him Rav, Shaul, Rabbi, Shaul, Paul. He, is a, he was a Pharisee all the way to the time of his death. He never left off Pharisee Judaism, and he testifies to that in his trial at the end of the book of Acts. So look at verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Mashiach also loved the assembly and gave, gave himself for her. So there's the word again. Loving is giving. 
And this is, he is explaining to Gentiles coming into the assembly the idea of, the Jewish idea of love. Is to give yourself to. Saying what? That my attitude towards my wife should be that of the Mashiach towards the assembly, which is what? What did Mashiach do? He died in order to save the assembly, in order to save his people. Okay? So the same thing is true for me, that I should love my wife to the extent that I'm willing to die for her. Okay? So loving is giving. All right. So, Emunah is the idea of faith. Belief. I believe. So, many people say that they believe in Jesus. I won't ask for a show of hands here, but I'm sure most of you would say that you believe in Jesus. If not all of you, right? So, what does that mean? What does it mean that you believe in Jesus? That He existed? That He did certain things? We call it a nominal faith. That is a faith in name only. Many Christians we call, we, we say are nominal Christians, that they're Christian in name only. That if you ask them what their religion is, they'll tell you it's Christianity. But they don't follow tenets. Hebrew is quite different. Because this word that is translated, emunah, that is translated faith, is this. Trust. It comes from this word, this Hebrew word, emet. Everyone say emet. Yes. Emet is the root of emunah. Emet means truth. There's another word that comes from these two words, which you are familiar with. You probably said it. Amen. 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 Everyone say amen. Amen. Amen means truth. So when you say Amen, when you say Amen, you're saying true. By the way, in Judaism, if I'm saying the prayer, I don't say Amen. You say Amen. I don't say Amen. amen. Do you know why? Amen. Do you know why? Because when I say Amen, basically what I'm saying is what he said. So I'm saying to myself, hey, yeah, dude, what you said, you're all right, you're right. Okay? So I said the words. There's no need for me to agree with myself. I already said the words. Everybody understand? So you say amen if you agree with what I'm saying. Okay? That's the way that works. So amen means true. Notice what you have here. Notice the root that's taking place here in all of this is what? Truth. 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 Now why is all of this important? Here's the distinction, the distinction, the distinguishing factor which is what makes the Hebrew word concrete as opposed to the variableness of the English word. In Hebrew terms, this requires obedience. I am required to obey. If I say that I trust, I'm saying that I obey. 
So, how many of you have the children protectors over your outlets in your house? Anybody? Bad parents. <laughs> A lot of parents with little kids have the child protectors, right? Why? To keep the child from sticking their fingers and other odd assortment of things into the outlet. Why? You don't want your child to get shocked, to get electrocuted. So, how many of you, when your children were growing up and they were venturing near the outlet, what did you do? Told your child, don't touch the outlet, don't put that, get away from there, it will bite you, it will shock you, it will hurt you. Did your child have emuna? Most children will do what? Go back and test you. What does she mean it will bite me? What does he mean it will hurt me? They don't believe until they've experienced. And then they know. Emuna says that I believe you. Therefore, I'm going to follow what you're saying. Okay, that's trust. That is the Hebrew version of trust. All of this is rooted in a very, very concrete analogy. Literally concrete. Because we have a picture window over here. Outside the building, it's all concrete blocks. All the way up, the whole, the whole face is concrete. Except for that opening right there. It's got glass in it. I want to ask you a question. Is that glass in that window holding up the wall above it? How much pressure, how much weight is on that glass? None. None. Could that glass bear the weight? There's a couple of tons of concrete there. Could the glass bear the weight of all that concrete? No. Then what's holding the concrete up? Very good. So, so here we have our picture window. And we have concrete blocks going up. By the way, all my, all my artwork is copyrighted because it's headed to the Smithsonian, so please. <laughs> all right, so we have concrete blocks. Directly above that window is an iron bar that goes from wall to wall. And all the blocks above it are on that. And it is that iron bar. It's called a lintel. All of the weight is on that bar. The glass has absolutely no weight, no pressure from the building at all. In fact, we could take that window out. The wall wouldn't fall. It would do nothing. We could take that window out and put another window in and it would make absolutely no difference at all. It would not change the shape of the building, nothing would move, nothing would be disturbed. Does everybody understand that? You have the same thing above the door. There's a lintel above every door that holds the door, whether it's a wooden one or a metal one, but there's a lintel above every door that holds the building up so that you can walk through that space. So how many of you, when you were coming in, this glass door over here tonight, you're coming in the door, all that concrete is above your head. How many of you stopped and hesitated when you opened the door and said, I don't know if I can go in there <laughs> because all this weight may come crashing down on top of me. Did you think about that? No. You simply opened the door and walked through. Why? Because you had trust that that lintel was going, even though you didn't know it was there, you had trust that that building, that the building is going to stay in its position. 
That's what we're talking about. That's the kind of trust. It's true that that window will not lose its shape or size, not even a millimeter of it, if I take the glass out because there's no pressure on the glass. It's all on the lint. That is trust, that's confidence. When you walked into the door, you have so much confidence that the building's not going to fall on your head that you don't even think about it. In fact, you came in, you sat down on chairs that you never even tried out before. You don't know if it holds your weight or it doesn't hold your weight or what, you don't know. But you have confidence that you sat in the chair. Believing that it would stop the pull of gravity on your body. True? Yeah. This is the difference between Hebrew thinking and Western thinking. You'll see this many times. In Hebrew, you have very concrete terms that have significance. And you can't bend that. You can't change that. It is what it is. Where... In English, it's abstract to us. Abstract saying, I can make it mean what I want it to mean. So I can say, I have faith, I believe in Jesus, I'm a Christian. But what does that mean? In Hebrew, when I say that, it means I have trust, I have confidence, it means I obey. It's a matter of obedience. So that is the concrete uh, uh, aspect of it. We're going to take a five minute break. And when we come back, we're going to get into Hebrew. Restrooms are over here. The first door to the right is the men. The second door to the right is the ladies. About Hebrew itself now. I want to show you because when you come in, on Thursday nights, when you come in, this is what you're going to see on the board. Every night there will be this on the board. Okay? So what you have is the Hebrew letter itself in the what we call the modern script. Modern as in it's only 2,000 years old. Okay? The script that you see in the Sidurim, in the Torah, uh, in a lot your books and things like that. This script, this script here, is the same script that was being used in Yeshua's day. It's the same script. Okay? But this is the modern script. There's another type of Hebrew um, that was used prior to that, used in the days of the prophets and the days of the kings. Okay? So, you will have the letter in Hebrew here. You will have its name transliterated for you. So, the first letter is called Aleph. Everyone say Aleph. Aleph. Then you will have a Paleo Hebrew. The letter in Paleo Hebrew, which is the ancient, the ancient, most ancient Hebrew. And this is related to the Phoenician languages and such as that. The reason why we do this is because this will actually help you understand where the definition is coming from when we give you the defining terms of the letter. For example, when we get into Aleph, and you're going to see some really cool things when we do this because all language is related. All language is related. So you're going to see some really cool things. And I'll show you something with this in just a minute. Then, then you will also have a number. Why? Because in Hebrew, every letter represents a number. They do not have numbers. We use the Arabic numbering system. 
In Hebrew, they use the Aleph bit as their numbering system. So basically it goes like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then it's going to go 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 200, 300, 400. Okay, so this right here can be the letter T or it can also be the number 400. If you turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalm 119. You will see the psalm divided up by the letters of the Aleph bit. So at the top, right under Psalm, right under the heading Psalm 119, it should say Aleph. You will go eight verses and it will say Bet. And you go eight verses and it will say Gimel. You go eight verses and it will say Dalet. All the way through. You do not see it in the, he in the English, in the Hebrew, each verse starts with that letter. So under Aleph, all those verses start with Aleph. Under Beit, all the verses start with the Beit. Under Gimel, all the letters start with, all the verses start with Gimel. But what he's telling you is Aleph, that's section one. Beit, that's section two. Gimel, that's section three. So if you're listening to a, a, a rabbi speaking in Hebrew in Israel or a messianic, and he, said, he tells you to go to Genesis 1, he will tell you to go, he will tell you, Vreshi Aleph, meaning Genesis 1. Okay? So saying that to say that the letters are also their numbers. Okay? So when you come into class, you will see this on the board. You need to write that down as soon as you get the opportunity. Write it down, write this information down. And then when class starts, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through the Aleph Bet. Aleph, and I'll point to, you, to it, and you say the letter Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dali, He, Va, Zayn, Chet, Tet, Yud, Kaf, Lamed, all the way down. When we finish that, we'll do that a couple of times. We'll come back and we will go one, two, three, all the way down. Okay? Now, we'll stop where we, to what, as we'll only go as far as what we know. Then the next week we'll add on another letter and another number. So you have the name, you have the Paleo Hebrew, and you have the number that it is. Okay? So that's what's going to be on the board when you come in. So I was telling you about the Paleo. What does that look like to you? It's another famous artwork going to the Smithsonian. What does that look like to you? Hmm? A steer. Okay. Looks like a steer. It is an, the head of an ox. It is the head of an ox. This is the head. These are the horns. It's the head of an ox. If I turn it, if I turn the head on its head. Now what does it kind of look like to you? How about if I give it like that? How about that? This is where you get your letter A from. And there's a reason why I'm telling you this, which I will reveal momentarily. So what do you know about the ox? Strong. Big and strong. <coughs> so, most of the Israelites were farmers and shepherds. They lived on farms. So the ox was what to them? 
What did the ox do? What did they use the ox for? To plow their fields. So the ox was their John Deere tractor. Okay, it was the John Deere tractor of their day. What do you know about a, a tractor? What do you know about a John Deere tractor? They're big, they're strong, they can go through practically anything, and they're very difficult to get stuck. Right? If you're out on the middle, of, if you're out in, in the middle of your farm on a rainy day, there's nothing like having a John Deere tractor to get you back home again, because that thing can go through a lot of stuff. So the whole idea that is being given here, the defining term of this word, is strength. Power. We're going to stop there, we're going to change gears a little bit, and then we're going to come back. Okay? Remember, I told you this to this is important. <coughs> Why? What came first, this or this? What came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first, this or this? This came first. By how long? Several thousand years. Several thousand years. Remember that I told you that the Paleo-Hebrew is very closely related to Phoenician. Phoenician is considered to be the oldest language by most geologists, archaeologists, and such as that, and linguists, that Phoenician is the oldest language, the oldest known written language, according to them. Why do I say according to them? Because in Judaism, we believe that Hebrew is actually the oldest language. In fact, it is called the holy language, the holy tongue. Because in Judaism, we believe that this is the language of heaven. This is the language of God. We believe that this was the language when God created the heavens and the earth. It does not say in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The oldest manuscript says, Reshit bara Elohim et hashabayim ve'et ha'aretz. Reshit, in the beginning, bara created Elohim, God, et hashabayim, the heaven, et ve'et ha'aretz, and the earth. So, in Judaism, the understanding is that this is the language of heaven, this is the language of God. You may choose to believe that or not believe that, that's up to you, I won't press the point with you. But this is what we believe. This is what we understand and there's good reason for it. We believe that this is the language of creation. In fact, the rabbis will tell you that before God created anything, He created the Aleph Bet. Why? What did God, how did God bring creation into being? He spoke it. He spoke it. In order to speak, you must have words, and in order to have words, you must have letters. Therefore, the rabbis say before God created anything in the universe, He created the Aleph Bet so that he could speak the words. And it is believed that Hebrew was the original language of the earth. In other words, from Adam all the way through Noah, all the way to Babel. From Adam to Noah to, Bab to, to Babylon, to the tower. It was Hebrew that was spoken by all the people of the earth up until the Tower of Babel. And from there, God dispersed the languages with the people.
he dispersed the people, and he caused them all to speak different languages. But that Hebrew was the original language. And you will see that this language, as you go through this class, you will see that this language is like no other language. In fact, I still to this day, when I'm reading some things, I get goosebumps. I marvel at the way the words are put together. I'll show you a little bit in just a minute. But it, it, it's a marvelous thing. <coughs> you can see the hand of God in this language, literally in every single letter. You can see the hand of God in its formation. So let me let me give you some things here. I'm going to give you a Hebrew transliteration of a word. Remember it. I'm going to give you the Hebrew transliteration. Then I'm going to give you the English form, the English definition. The translation. Keep in your mind what came first, the English or the Hebrew. Okay? Now, for example, here, Asta. Everybody say Asta. The definition is this store. Now what I'm telling you is not that they're going to be exactly alike. What I'm telling you is because Hebrew, <coughs> Hebrew is a consonantal language. That is, all of the alphabet, it's all consonants, no vowels. And in fact, in the original Hebrew, the vowels did not come into being until 600 AD, CE, the common era. 600. They were brought into being by a group of rabbis called Masorim. Masorim are the men, are the rabbis who brought about the Masoretic text of the scripture, of the Bible, which most of your English Bibles come from. They come from the Masoretic text. If you read the introduction of the translators and all that, and it will tell you that this came from, that they based it mainly on the Masoretic text. So from these Masorim. They came up with what were called Nikudot, vowel markers. Why? Because the Jews had been dispersed throughout the world. So if all of us were taken from this place, we all speak English here, but we're taken from this place and we're moved to a place where English is not spoken at all. And there we have children. You're living in a village or a town by yourself. You're the only English speaker there and you have your children there, and you raise your children there, what language are they going to speak? They will speak English, because that's your native language, correct? That's your home language. But they will also undoubtedly learn the language of the people around them. Their children, what language are they going to speak? Because your children speak both languages, but because they're in this population where only the other language is spoken, then the main language is going to be what? Yeah. The other language. By the third and the fourth generation, the original language, the home language, it is basically unknown. I.e., when I was working in the school district, when I was working at the high school, most of the Hispanic community, most of the Hispanic students in the school could not speak fluent Spanish because they had been living in an English society for all of this time, for these generations that they had lost the ability. The same thing happens in every culture. It's called assimilation. We are assimilated into the main population. So the Jewish people, when they were scattered by the Romans throughout all of Europe, they assimilated into those populations. Therefore, they were losing their ability to converse, to read and write Hebrew. So the Masorim came about with the Masoretic text to help those people maintain their Hebrew fluency. Now eventually, a lot of it was lost 
to the people of Europe. And in effect, Hebrew became what was called a dead language. It was not spoken, not prevalent. It was spoken in the synagogue and such as that, but it was not a conversant language. When did Hebrew become a conversant language? Between 1948 and 1950, when Israel became a nation, there was a man who emigrated to Israel. And he and his wife decided that they wanted to speak the language of the land, the language that their forefathers spoke. So he began to study Hebrew. And he and his wife made a pact that they and their children would speak only Hebrew from there on. So they started putting little signs on all of the, on the door and on the window, what the Hebrew name, what the Hebrew word was. And their neighbors found out about it. And they thought that was a neat idea. So they started the same thing. Within just a few years, Hebrew had become the national language of Israel. What a lot of people don't know, because Hebrew is the language of Israel today, the predominant language, what most people don't know, that there was a real battle over what the language should be, English or German. because that's what most of the immigrant, immigrants spoke. And one man and his wife flipped the whole thing. And today, Hebrew is the language of Israel. Okay? So, the thing is, what I'm trying to show you here is it's a consonant language, so you look at the consonants. Those are the roots. These are related words. This is not a conclusive list, this is just to give you an idea. This is the Hebrew. This is the English definition, translation. Yalad, yel, kafat. I love this word, kafat, as in Yom Kippur. The kafat is the cover of the ark, what is called the mercy seat. It's actually called a kafat, to cover. Notice here. What do men wear on their heads? Cap. A cap to do what? Cover to cover the head. <clears throat> you have edits. So here you have Babel, very clear there. Bad means barley. What do you make out of barley? Beer. Where do you store your barley? In a barn. 
Gamel means camel. Chalak means to walk. So you see these relationships, these associations. Just saying, and as I said, this is not, there are literally hundreds of these words. You can go on the internet, search them out. There are hundreds of them. Some of them, hmm, maybe, maybe not. But a lot of them you can see very clearly. And the thing is this. Which language came first, Hebrew or English? So we spoke concerning the Hebrew Aleph bit that, that it is a consonant language. So all of these are consonants. There are no vowels here. The vowels appear as markers either under the consonant, when you're reading under the consonant, or to the side of it. Okay? But there are no vowels in Hebrew. There are no vowel letters in Hebrew. As in A, E, I, O, U. There are no vowel letters in Hebrew. When you go, if you were to go to a synagogue and they invited you to come up to read from the Torah scroll, it would only be consonants. So, it would be like reading something like this. I gave this to you. You guys said that we're here last night. Shh. <laughs> so, tell me what that means. That's what it's like to read Hebrew. So the master had said, the, the Masoyim said, okay, we've got to help these people out. They're struggling with it. So let's help them out a little bit. Let's put some vowels under there. Saying that when you go up to read the Torah scroll, you have to know what it says. You have to be able to read it. And there are no vowels. So you have to be able to put the vowels in. So most people practice and practice and practice with something that has the vowels in it, so they kind of memorize what the script is. And then they have someone, they will have someone standing off to the side with the Torah, a written Torah, with the Nikudot in it, with the vowels in it. And he is a corrector, so that if he misreads out of the scroll, and the guy standing here helping him gives him the proper pronunciation, what is the proper vowel that goes into that word. Okay, to ensure that it is being written correctly. As I was sharing with you earlier concerning the Aleph, every letter has its own significance. So the Aleph, the significance of Aleph is it's the idea of strength. What is the strongest power you know? Huh? Electrical. <clears throat> what is the strongest power you know? God. God. So guess what in Hebrew, guess what God starts with? Aleph. Elohim. Starts with the Aleph. Okay? In saying that, let me give you two things here. One, another question, what's the next letter? It's Beit, it's the B sound, Beit. Aleph Beit. So I'm going to ask you a question. Why in the alphabet is B located next to A? Why did they put the B next to A? Why did they put the C next to the B? Why the D next to the C? Why the E next to the D? Why the F? I can go through all of them. Why? Why did, he, why did they do that? Why did they put them in that order? 
We don't know. They're just in that order. That's the order we learned them in. That's where they are. The same thing as what does A mean? What does B mean? What does C mean? What does D mean? They don't mean anything. They're just letters. It's not until you put them into a word that they have meaning, that they have significance. When you put them all together, A, P, P, L, E, now you have something, right? Right? If I say A, P, P, L, E, now I have something, right? But what does the A in Apple mean? What does the P in Apple mean? What does the L? See, each individual letter means nothing. It's not until you put all the letters together that they mean something, that it makes any sense to you. In Hebrew, no. This letter means something, and this letter means something. And when I put them together, it means something. You see, every letter loans we call these letters, it's called being pregnant. These letters are pregnant. That is that they have more than just their form. They have something within them. So when you put these letters together, they bring that defining term in with them into the word. And that helps you to define the word. Okay? Saying that, you're going to find this out. So... Why is the bait next to the olive? You will hear this over and over in this class. Why is the bait next to the olive? There is a relationship between those two letters. There's a significance between them. They're related. The gimel is next to the bait. It's between the bait and the dalit. Why? Because it's related to both of those two letters. There's a relationship. It's not apparent in its form, its figure, its sound. But when you understand the defining term of it, then you'll see the relationship of it. So every letter is next to every other letter because it has a relationship with the letter in front of it and the letter behind it. And that's the order. Guess who put them in their order? God. He's the one who de determines the relationships. By the way, guess who put your life in order? The people that are around you are around you because God put them there. There's a relationship that is established by God Himself in all of our lives. The structure of my life. The things that come into my life. It's all by the hand of God. This is Judaism 101. Everything is by God. It's determined by God. So even the letters are next to each other by the hand of God, because there's a relationship between those letters. The rabbis say that when Mashiach comes, he will explain Torah to us. But not only will he explain Torah to us, he will explain the individual books of Torah. Five books. <clears throat> not only will he explain the individual books to us, he will explain the individual verses to us. Not only will he explain the individual verses, he will even explain to us the words. But not only will he explain to us the words, he will explain to us the letters that make the words. But the rabbis say, not only will he explain to us the letters that make the words, he will even explain to us the spaces between the letters. Why? So I have this, and I have this, and I have this, and what do I have? Another great artwork, copyrighted, no pictures, please. What do I have? An atom. An atom. And this is the nucleus and We'll say that this is the proton and this is the electron. Okay? Is that all that's in the atom? Space. There's space here, correct? But is it really space? 
Or are there particles there that are unseen and unknown? You've heard of the Hadron Collider? That's one of the things that they're doing, right? They're looking to see what's in that space. Is it really space? Or something there? Mashiach will explain the spaces between the letters. What's really cool is the rabbis call the Aleph Bet the DNA of creation. By the way, you, this is an atom. It can also be this. All our solar system is is a giant atom. And there's lots of space between the Earth and the Sun. Is it empty? Or is there stuff there? Come on, not a trick question. Is it empty or is there stuff there? It looks empty, but it's not empty. Dark matter. Okay? Well, and we call it also what? Mass. There's mass. I mean, everything is made up of atomic molecules. By the way, those of you who have been in this class before, you already know, I highly recommend you watch The Matrix about 15 times. <laughs> because guess what? The Matrix is the explanation of the Mashiach, of the Messiah. It was made by two Jewish men. It was written by two Jewish men. And the Matrix is all about these things. Quantum physics, quantum science, spooky science, at a distance, all of these things were discovered through Kabbalah. Who discovered, who, did, who, who was the one that, 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 that uh, was the great proponent of quantum physics and spooky matter at a distance? Who designs at a distance? Einstein, who was a Jew who studied Kabbalah. That's where it came from. E equals MC squared is a Kabbalistic concept that Einstein came across. And he plugged it into his equations. And guess what? So, Everything has to do with the cosmos. And it's all replication. It's all replication. We're going to get into some cool things like, do I even exist? Am I really here? Are you there? If I turn my back on the table and I stop looking at it, does the table disappear? Why? One of the laws of thermodynamics is the conservation of energy. What better way to conserve energy than for the table to disappear and so did my whole class when I turned my back. You get into all kinds of cool things like where do we exist? Where do you exist? We exist on this earth, but where's earth? And is this universe the only universe? Is there a parallel universe or two or three? We say that we're three-dimensional. No, we're four. No, actually, we're seven. No, actually, we're nine. Well, comes to find out, we're 12, 14, 17. And guess what? I was reading a couple of weeks ago that they think they found two more. But all we can see is three. And yet all of this is engraved in, 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 in is, is in, grade in the Hebrew alphabet. All of these concepts appear in Hebrew, in Judaism. Hundreds of years before our modern scientists ever discovered them. The Jewish sages were discussing them. So, really cool stuff. Alright, let me give you a sample, one more sample of what we're going to do, of how this works, and we'll close for tonight. 
By the way, I told you there was a number here, and a number here, and a number here. So when I put two words together, like Aleph and Bet, that is a word by the way, we'll talk, talk about that in a minute. When I put Aleph and Bet together, I'm also adding these two numbers together. So, but, say it with me, come on. Good, not a trick question. Right? So guess what? Every word that you add up the letters and they come to that sum is related to every other word that comes up to that same sum. So, we have a term called Mashiach, the Messiah, and we have another term called Nakshon, the serpent. They add up to the same sum. Guess what? Is there a relationship between the Mashiach and the serpent? There's a relationship. I didn't say that it was a good one. There's a relationship. What does he do? He came to crush the serpent's head. And he says in John 3, before 16, he says what? Even as Moshe lifted up the Nachshon in the wilderness, so must Ben Adam, the son of man, be lifted up. This is called gematria. And it's really, really cool stuff. Mind-blowing a lot of times to the point where one has to say a man could not have devised these things. Just with our first three letters. Because you see, when you put Aleph Together with bait, you come up with gimel. One, one plus two equals three. Okay? So, bait. Aleph means strength. Bait. This is the B sound. By the way, Aleph has no sound. It is a silent letter. And we'll get into this in more detail because we're going to take Aleph on full blow next week. But just giving you samples here. Aleph, Beit, and this also explains to you why these two letters are next to each other. Beit is the B sound, it's actually a B or a V, depending on whether it's got what is called a Dagesh, a mark in the middle makes it a B hard. You take the dot out and it becomes soft V. These are a couple of and it sounds made with the lips, B and V. So it can be either one of these. <coughs> when people are speaking Spanish fast, they do that, do they not? They will say their B, they will say a B like a V. Okay, so you have that relationship. What is it? Well, bait itself, bagit, means house. You'll usually see it, see it spelled like this, bait. So what is the paleo? The paleo is a picture, a map of a tent. What did the people live in? They were shepherds. They lived in tents. This is looking at the top. Okay? This is the... I'll draw a big for you. This is the tent. So you would come in here. This is the public area, if you would, what would be equivalent to your living room. Back here, there would be another a curtain, and this is, the, the, this is the family area here, and this is the bedroom. So you have a tent. Can everybody see that? It's a map of a tent. Okay? Why? Because bait means house. And in their days, that's what their house was. It was a tent. So, let me put two letters together. Aleph Bet. I put that together. What is the what is the defining term of the Aleph? What is the defining term of the Bet?
So when I put these two letters together to make a word, I take this defining term and I take this defining term and throw them in there, the strength of the house, the transliteration of this would be this. Actually, it would be more of this, but... So this is the Aleph and this is the Bait Av, which means Father. What is the strength of the house? The Father is the strength of the house. This is the way Hebrew works. So remember what I told you about the B, the, the, the B and the V sound? Here. So in the B, what do I have to do to make it a hard B? So you have to have the Dadesh in the B to make it strong, to make it a hard B. So here's what the rabbi said when they were teaching me Hebrew. The man, when the man is in the house, the house is strong, but big. When the man is out of the house, the house is not strong, it's weak, the. Cool concept to help you remember, but it's the olive next to the bit. It's the strength of the house. And you put the strength of the house, you put those two letters together, and you come up with the Hebrew word, father. Words related to father, you have Av, father, you have Avi, which is my father. You have the famous term that Paul uses in Romans, that you should call, that we have the right to call him Abba, which means dad. One more thing. One more thing. Ready? So, what's the next letter? Watch how this works. What's the next letter? Huh? Aleph, Bey, Gimel. Okay. Numbers? One, two, three. Put them together. One. Plus two equals three. Okay, so one. Plus two, two equals three. So you have a gimel. Gimel, by the way, means camel. Okay. But the defining term is a camel, but the defining term here is that he's a rich man. He's rich. Now put it all together. This is Gematria. Put it all together. What was it? Aleph plus B equals Gimma. One plus two equals three. When the strength is in the house, it's a rich house. A man who has a home is a rich man. Your family is the most important, the most valuable resource you have. It's the most valuable thing that you possess, is your home. This is Judaism 101. And this is the way Hebrew works. So, you have strength, you have a house, you have a rich man. And God has just told you something in the very beginning of the Aleph day. When a home has a father in the home, has a husband in the home, and when a man has a strong home, you're wealthy. 
The truth of the matter is, how many of you remember your dating days? For some of us, that's been a long time ago. Do you remember your dating days? Did any of you have any problems with your parents when you were dating? Yes? yes? How many of you said this to your love? It's okay. All we need is each other. I can live in a cardboard box if I have you. We can live in the car. We don't need anybody else. All we need is you and me. Right? Sonny and Cher, I got you, babe. Remember that one? I'm dating myself. Anyway. That's exactly what God is telling you with the first three letters of the olive bit. A man with a home is a wealthy man. And the truth of the matter is when a man is the strength of his home and he has that home, when the husband and the wife are together, they don't need anything else. They don't need anybody else. They have each other. And many husbands and many wives have survived many horrible things because of that very thing. In fact, many survivors of the Holocaust survived by that very thought. That when they get got out, perhaps they would be able to see their husband or their wife again. And that's what kept them alive. That's what pushed them on. You've learned your first Hebrew, Aleph Bet, Jewish lesson. The home is the most important possession you have. Take good care of it. The home comes first, above all. I grew up in church. I grew up the son of a pastor, became a pastor. And I watched many homes fall apart. I watched many pastors' homes fall apart. You want to know why? How many of you have heard the pastor's kids are the worst kids? They cause the most trouble. They're the rebels of the church. They're the, they're the ones that stir up all the, all the problems, right? Do you know why? Because the pastor is so busy taking care of everybody Because the pastor is so busy taking care of everybody else that he doesn't have time for his own family. That's exactly it. In Judaism, the synagogue is not the most important place. The home is the most important place. And you must take care of your home. It takes precedent above all others. Above everything else. The synagogue did not even come into play until the Babylonian captivity. That's where the first synagogues were. In order to teach the, the children Torah and Hebrew and Judaism, these things. You know where the family met for Shabbat? Where was the family on Shabbat before the synagogue came into play? They were in home. The father was enjoying his family. And the family enjoying their father. But I have watched the, denom the denomination that I came out of. Oh, you have to be in church. And in the denomination I came out of, it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And if you didn't show up, you were made to feel guilty. Nope. Family comes first. The home comes first. That's what's important. So that's your first lesson in Judaism. Your first lesson of the olive bit. The most important possession you have is your home. Take care of it. 
the very beginning, in Breshit, he creates Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, and he tells them to do what? A man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one. One flesh. In the beginning, when God created Adam, Judaism teaches this. He did not create just a man. He created Adam and Chava at the same time. Proof. Where did Chava come from? Inside him? So what the sages say is that Chava was already there. That all he did was take her out. He removed her from within him. Why? He said, he said, uh, let us make man in our image. The Selmo Elohim. Um, let's see. It says, verse 27, 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, created, he created him. Male and female created them. And the rabbis say, why does he say that? Because he has not created Chava yet. The creation of Chava, the removal of Chava, does not come until the next chapter. And then not even at the beginning of the chapter. So now you have a question. Why? And this is the way Judaism works. The rabbis sit there and they see things like that. And they say, why does it say that there? Why is that there? Because everything in the Bible, everything in Torah is put in its place position for a reason and to make you ask a question. How do you get your children to learn? See, I'm teaching you by asking you questions. How do you get your children to learn? You ask them questions. So God wants you to ask a question here. Why does it say this? Why does it say, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. All in one statement. And the rabbis say, because God created him, male and female, at the same time, and then later he removes Chava, saying that God has both male and female attributes. We call him he, but the truth of the matter is that God has both male and female attributes. So when God created Adam, he created him in his own image with all of the attributes. The female was within, so the female attributes were within him, as well as the male attributes that were within him. When God removed Chava, she took with her the female attributes. And Adam was left with the male attributes, for the most part. All of the attributes are still there, but for the most part, in the home, in the family, who is the harder and who is the softer of the parents? Come on, who is the harder, who is the softer of the parents? For the most part, in most homes. Father is harder, mother is softer. Right? These are the male and female attributes. So, the attribute of the male is Gevura. Tree of life people, Gevura, strength. The attribute of the mother, of the wife, is chesed, kindness. This is why the husband is to protect his wife with his very life. Because literally, she is a part of him. She came out from him. She came out from him. 
So the scripture says what? Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. What is that? That God took her out and now what? Now he puts you back together again. She is a part of you. Therefore you must protect her with your own life and you must treat her as well as you would treat yourself. And that's what makes a good home. When the husband has the proper love to give himself for his wife because he realizes that she is from his own body. And when the wife has the proper respect for the husband because she came out from that body. When we get that concept and we put it into practice, that's when you have a good and a strong home. And that's what he's talking about. You find it at the beginning of the alphabet. You find it at the beginning of Torah. It all works. So with that we say, Rachot shalom ve laila tov.